ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, last week, and uh, we're in Colossians chapter 3, and uh, we'll just pick up in verse 5. We'll read the uh, couple verses here. We're actually running into verse 8 where we left off. But of course, it reads here in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, uh, for which things sake uh, the wrath of God cometh uh, upon the children of disobedience, in the which uh, also ye walked some time when ye lived in them. And then, of course, here's verse 8, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. And here we are in verse 8. And so we see here uh, that Paul's picking up, uh, talking about, you know, but now, we're seeing this in the first two words of uh, verse 8. Uh, talking about that there's, you know, of course, a, a change that happens in the dispensational, uh, a dispensation of grace, you know, a, a change where he's saying, but now he also put off all these. And so we're seeing this, uh, he's going to go into talking uh, about putting off the old man and putting on the new man, which has to do also with uh, the parts of, uh, of uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, about uh, going through not only understanding where we're headed, which is uh, you know, the judgment seat of Christ and the heavenly places, but understanding that we've uh, trusted the gospel, we've been translated into God's you know, kingdom, quote unquote, not the kingdom, uh, the earthly kingdom, of course, but uh, God's kingdom in general. So in between translation and uh, judgment, we understand that we're going to be going into uh, you know, transformation, and we're going to be trans you know, by putting off the old man, putting on the new man. So we see here in verse uh, 8, where he's going on to say, uh, based on what he's saying from verses 5, 6, and 7, uh, but now he also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. And he goes on to refer to the Colossians, uh, letting him know about this here. And so as he goes on and he says this, we find this also in the book of Ephesians. We talked about this before, how Colossians is a book of correction, whereas Ephesians is a book of uh, uh, letting them know, you know doctrinal uh, information and stabilization, letting them know God's plan and purpose for the dispensation of grace and for everything else. But yet Paul is letting these two churches know pretty much a lot of the same information. But Paul uses it for correction to the Colossians because they are not upholding the head. They don't see Christ as uh, the fullness of God being all in all, and they have to add some uh, information to Christ. And so Paul's telling them not to do that. You know, he lets them know such things as, or they think they have to do such things as add philosophy to Christ or the tradition of men into Christ or the law of Moses into Christ. And they have to add these, these man-made features into Christ so that they can be further complete. And Paul's saying, you don't need these things to be further complete. You are complete in the complete one who's God, Jesus Christ. You don't need these other things to add into it. And so it's more of a book of correction for the Colossians. And, of course, we learn from that. We benefit from what the instruction is that Paul gives to the Colossians. And we see also with the Ephesians, if we go there now, we'll see more of the same information. We go to, uh, so for example, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 26. In Ephesians 4, 26, we're seeing as uh, the Apostle Paul tells the Colossians to put off anger and wrath and malice. We're seeing that he'll tell the Ephesians more so the same thing, but he's not telling them in the form of a corrective manner. He's telling them in the form of uh, something else. And so what he's going to tell them, he'll say in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 26, he says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So as we see that in verse 26, uh, the way he's saying it to them is uh, by means of instruction. And he's saying, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So, of course, if you were to read that and try to look for some sort of contradiction, so to speak, you'd see that in uh, Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 8, you'd see, but now he also put off all these. You know, anger, you want that you put off. And when you look at Ephesians uh, chapter 4, and you see that in verse uh, 26, you see, be ye angry and sin not. So then you hear something about, well, there I see a contradiction, so on and so forth. And uh, what we're seeing here is the idea in verse 26 that you can go ahead and be angry. And the whole point is uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a time and a place for anger, but yet not for sin. You can deal with your anger in a way where you don't end up sinning uh, as much as possible. You go forth and you do what you need to do 
with the anger, even if it's righteous anger or justified anger, but you don't go out and sin due to the anger that you have. And so he teaches this to the Ephesians. And yet we see here in verse uh, 3, uh, going back to uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, But now so put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication from your mouth. The way he's saying this to the uh, Colossians is that he's talking about their old man. And when he talks about this, uh, we saw this based on what we were reading in verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And he went on and described all these things. And uh, he said this in verse, uh, not only from verse 5 and 6, and then the 7 now leads into 8, but he's describing the old man that needs to be put off. And the reason why it needs to be put off is because we're dead to it. That's who we used to be. And when we trusted the gospel, we were considered in the mind of Christ and the mind of God that we were crucified with Christ. That's Galatians 2.20. And then we were dead with Christ, Romans 6. We were buried with Christ. And we were also therefore risen with Christ and therefore justified by Christ's actions, not by ours. And so that's, what God, that's how God sees us. That's in his mind. That's in his sight. That's how he views a believer today is that we were not only um, crucified with Christ, but therefore a crucified individual is dead, buried, and risen again, just as Christ was. So we're not Christ, but we are the benefits of his actions. We are the beneficiaries of his actions. So we see that there, and that's how we know we're heirs, uh, because of what Christ did. And we're adopted into uh, Christ because of what he did. So it's all positional truth. It's all understanding our identity. And so we read this here and going back into verse 8. But now also uh, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, and we see even their blasphemy, the concept of uh, blasphemy coming up. And if we want to see how blasphemy was dealt with when it comes to even the law in the Old Testament, and we, uh, we were doing our uh, study in Romans chapter 3, we, we understood how in Romans chapter 3, how just the understanding of trying to find justification or righteousness by the law all it did was show what your sin was, and it brought death. Well, let's look at an example of that as we're studying why we need to uh, put off anger, wrath, malice, and blasphemy. Let's look at an example of blasphemy. If you look at Leviticus chapter 24, verse 11. There we go. Okay. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 11. Well, then what we're going to see. There we go. Yeah, Leviticus. 24 verse 11, we're going to see an example, an Old Testament example of Israel under the law and what happens when somebody blasphemes the name of the Lord and uh, the, the uh, punishment that's due when you live under the law. But that's why when people, when you hear different churches or religious groups say that we're justified by the law, we're saved by obeying the law, we obe I obey everything under God's law, uh, they don't. And here's an example of uh, what we find. Leviticus 24, verse 11 reads, And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses, and uh, his mother's name was Shilameth, the daughter of uh, Dibri, the, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp. And let all that hurt him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. Uh, and it goes on from there. But you're seeing the idea of what happens when, when you uh, try to put yourself under the law. Uh, why you read Romans 3, 19 through 21 the way you read it, and why the book of Galatians is out there today, because you can't obey the law and expect to find life and righteousness and holiness and so on and so forth. We're reading, if someone just blasphemes the name of the Lord, uh, they get killed. They're, that's that's a death sentence just for blaspheming. The name. And we go on to read other 
other such uh, events in the, in the Old Testament, where you pick up sticks on the Sabbath day, that's a death sentence. You blaspheme the name of the Lord, you're gone. And so you see examples, as we bring it back to Colossians chapter 3, where we see uh, that, this, that uh, it's not where we're at today, of course, in the dispensation of grace, but yet we see when they talk about how uh, you've got the God of the Old Testament, quote unquote, and you bring it over to what people call today the God of the New Testament. Well, we're not either. We're not of the Old Testament. We're not of the New Testament. We're in. We're preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We're in the mystery program, the dispensation of grace. We still see based on verse five. I'm sorry, verse eight. That it says, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. We're still seeing that God's not going to stone you. God's not going to give orders to stone. God's not going to have anyone go out there and kill you because you're not under the law. That's not what God's doing today. But yet we're finding God still doesn't approve of blasphemy, filthy communication uh, out of your mouth. That's still not a desired ordeal. That's still not something that is uh, that he finds righteous. God still, as we find here, God still doesn't like sin. It's just that he's, gonna go, he's not going to go out and kill you because of that. In fact, he'll go out and save you. Because of that. And as a result of that, we can understand that our old man is crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Our old man is dead, Romans 6.6. 6. And as a result of that, we'll probably go more into Romans 6 in a little bit. And we see that we have to reckon things to be so according to the mind of Christ, according to the mind of God. And we reckon our minds to be as what God would put things to be. So who we used to be, what we used to do uh, before we were saved, whether it was in ignorance or whether we did it on purpose or whether we did things the way we did things that were anti-christ anti-christ uh, we walked in the ways that christ would never have us walk uh, now we intentionally understand that these are wrong and we put off the old man and put on the new man we do this understanding these things and lining our understanding up with the word of god rightly divided so we see that in verse 8 blasphemy filthy communication out of your mouth we see as it goes into verse 9 lie not one to another seeing that ye have put off the old man excuse me, the old man with his deeds. And it goes on to say that here in verse uh, 9. Lie not one to another, uh, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. If you see this again, it comes up again in Ephesians. If we look at Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 22, we're going to read it as Paul says it to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, verse 22, again, we're seeing a lot of the same information coming back up to him. And we see that he says here that he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, and wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so we see that kick in with uh, Ephesians chapter 4. But he's saying, you're kind of seeing the same information come up in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses uh, 8 and 9, that we're seeing in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 through 26. And it's coming up that way on purpose. We're seeing that the information is going out that way to uh, give them information uh, the way it needs to be given. So he says that here uh, in verse 9, he's saying, Line out one to another. And he says that, uh, seeing that ye have put, uh, put off the old man with his deeds. And of course, that again goes back to what we saw in Colossians chapter 2. As Paul was telling them in verse 11, he had said to them, And whom also ye are circumcised with that circumcision, or with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, uh, buried with them in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. So as we understand this, we're seeing that from Colossians 3, 9, he's saying, Lay not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. The only way we understand that we've put off the old, we have to reckon everything to be the way uh, what God says in his word has actually taken place. When we trusted the gospel, we understand based on Colossians 2.11 that we've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. There's the circumcision with hands we read about in Genesis and all the religious, uh, uh, different religions take place in today. It's a circumcision with hands. We're understanding that there is a spiritual circumcision that took place where who we used to be was cut away from who we are now. 
And that's who we used to be before we trusted the gospel. And so we see that in verse 11 to 11 of Colossians, saying that uh, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And so by the circumcision of Christ, the circumcision that uh, didn't occur due to us, it occurred due to what Christ did for us. Uh, it was by the faith of the operation of God, we see that in verse 12, that not only did we have a circumcision of Christ, uh, circumcision made without hands, but we were also positionally buried with him in baptism. That's a baptism without any water in it. That's a baptism we find that is, uh, you know, baptism means identification. So we were identified with Christ based on the things that he's done for us. And we trust in his gospel and allows that to be so. So we see this in verse 12. Through the faith and the operation of God, all these things have taken place. This is who hath raised him from the dead. This is what God has done for Christ as well. God, Jesus is God, so we know all this to be true equally. So going into verse 9, Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have, based on what we just read, uh, Colossians 2, 11 and 12, ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And Romans 6 will go into that even further. Uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. But that's our identity, unsaved, in the first step. We know today that there's, it's, and we'll get to this in another verse as well. It's not about are you, uh, who are you today? Are you rich or poor or white or black or old or young or male or female or any of these things? Uh, those are, that's not what Christ is seeking out in the individual today. He's looking to see, are you saved and do you trust his gospel or, or do you not? It's just as simple as those two things. That's it. That's the only two things that Jesus is talking about today in the dispensation of grace. He's not saying, how rich are you? How white are you? How black are you? How old are you? How young are you? He's, all these things are not are just irrelevant. He's saying you're either saved and you trust the gospel, the right gospel, or you're lost. And religious people can be lost. Pastors can be lost. Preachers can be lost. Church members can be lost. They can go to church every week with the Bible and be completely, totally lost. And so we see this in um, Colossians chapter 3. And we're going into verse, or we read verse 9, going into verse 10, says, And have put on the new man, based on putting off the old man, we're putting on the new man in verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And then it goes into verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So based on verses 10 or 11, 10 and 11, He's saying, and have put on the new man, based on putting off the old man, we're putting on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. So in order to be renewed in knowledge, we've got to study. 2 Timothy 2.15, and we study all of God's word and rightly divide it. So that's uh, for, or 2 Timothy 3.16 with 2 Timothy uh, 2.15. We're putting all of God's word together in the proper context, rightly dividing it, and allowing the word to work effectually in us. And so we see that here in verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. We want to be constantly renewed in knowledge as we put verses together properly to understand what God's will is today. So we can understand it and operate accordingly. And we can do so in understanding our identity, understanding what Christ is doing, understanding who God is, and understanding what God's not doing. So we see that here in verse uh, 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. And as we know that is renewed in knowledge, uh, we can see this as we look in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 23. We keep going back to Ephesians 4. That's because there's uh, a lot in there tonight. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Uh, we won't just stay there, but we see in Ephesians 4, 23, it goes on to say, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so this is where we want to plug that in. We want to be renewed in the spirit of our mind based on right doctrine. It's in the mind where we want to be renewed at. And this is what he's saying also in verse 10 of Colossians 3, that we want to be renewed in knowledge. Uh, we want this to take place there. But if we look even further, we go to uh, Romans uh, chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. We're going to see more about this as well, being renewed in the spirit of our mind and uh, right service, practical application of service. We read here, uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's going to happen through study, 2 Timothy 2.15, based on what we read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. 
and where we are in Colossians chapter uh, 3, verses uh, 10 and 11. All this plugs in with the renewing of the mind through right doctrine, rightly divided. Which means if we're plugging in wrong information, our mind isn't getting renewed, it becomes corrupted. So you could study all the wrong Bible verses. Imagine if we went to Leviticus 24 and tried to take it literally. Every time some uh, child went out and blasphemed the name of the Lord, we would actually try to find stones to stone them because we read that and thought we had to take it literally. That's what people are doing today in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're reading the verses. They're seeing the red letters. And they think, well, that's Jesus Christ talking, so I better obey every word he says in there. And, of course, it is Jesus Christ talking, but it's he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to them about their program with their events taking place in their timeline with what God's going to be doing with them in the end time events. We have our own set of events. We have our, we're, our own, we're the church, the body of Christ. We're God's heavenly people with a heavenly purpose. Jews are God's earthly people for God's earthly purpose. And uh, as long as if we're starting to mix the two up, then we mix up our identity. We mix up God's plan. We mix up God's purpose. We mix everything up, and we don't want to be doing that. So we want to make sure that we're renewed in the spirit of our mind, understanding what Israel is going to have done to it. Israel, understanding what the Jews are going to have, what Israel is going to have, what the prophecy program is all about, and yet understanding what the mystery program is, that Paul's our pattern in the dispensation of grace, and that we can go ahead and operate in right doctrine according to preaching Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, with Paul as the pattern and Paul's gospel as the gospel. And that's what Paul says in Romans 16, 25. He says that those three things will set you up straight. So you read that in uh, Romans 16, 25. It's not only by the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, but it's also by his gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, and by the uh, scriptures of the prophets. And so as you rightly divide the script, the Old Testament, and everything else in the Bible, you rightly divide it, put it in its proper context, you can still be stabilized by what you're reading and learning uh, against everything else that's out there that's being taught wrong. So we see that in, uh, as we go back to where we are, that's how we'll be renewed in the uh, knowledge uh, after the image of him that created him. We're seeing that in verse 10. So that's why Paul says, I die daily. The more knowledge we gain, the more understanding and the more studying we do, the more we die daily so that we can operate, not in our old man. We want to reckon that so to be dead. And so we want to operate in the new man, which is uh, where we're at today based on the fact that we've trusted Christ's gospel, the correct gospel, the right gospel. And so it's not about us and how much faith we have. It's that we've trusted the right gospel and the faith of the operation of God takes place. God does all the working, even if we don't see it, even if we don't feel it. We believe that we've trusted uh, the right gospel. And so therefore, based on what God says in his word, we study the word and we allow the word to work in us. Therefore, uh, it takes place accordingly. So we see that in verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And we see in verse 11 where there is, this is of course talking about the body of Christ, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. Uh, but Christ is all in him. So you're seeing all the different types of things that was going on in Paul's day. This is all the, the ranks and titles and positions that people held. And they were proud to be a Greek. They were proud to be a Jew. So a Jew would say, well, I'm glad I'm not a Greek. And the Greek would say, I'm glad I'm not a Jew. Or maybe they said, I wish I was a Jew and not a Greek. And so maybe they would go back and forth about their titles or their nationalities or uh, something that had to do with one of those things. Or if you see their circumcision or uncircumcision, uh, we can read in Galatians how it had, how neither one has anything to do with the other. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised as far as your position uh, when it comes to uh, being a Jew or a Gentile. You know, we know that uh, circumcision was Israel, uh, according to the 12 tribes, and the uncircumcision were, were the Gentiles. And we can see a little bit about an example of that. If we look for an example, we even go back to the Old Testament and read that. If we look at, say, dealing with the uncircumcision and the circumcision, if we go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, we're just going to see an example for how that gets used. 1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse 26. And let's see, let's go there. 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. This is the David and Goliath historical account. 
And we're going there just to see, because we're seeing here in Colossians 3.11, he's talking about Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian sin. So all these different ranks, all these different titles. Those mattered in prophecy, in the prophetic program, where the Jews were the head and not the tail. And all the other nations had to flow into Israel, and God was dealing with Israel as his channel of blessings to the other nations. We're not in that program today. But God has about 95% of the Bible talking about that program. And where the 5% has nothing to do with that. So we see in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, it's David and Goliath. But yet, here are the words that David says about Goliath. Here's how he speaks about him. He says, And David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? So he makes it a point, David is part of the circumcision, Jews, Israel, of the 12 tribes. And he, as he describes Goliath, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You know, he's uncircumcised, he's part of the uncircumcision, he's a Gentile. And so he makes it a point to say, who is this you know, member of the uncircumcision? Who is this Gentile? Because I'm a circumcised Jew. And so it's a big deal in prophecy. The, these terms, these definitions, these ranks, these titles make a big deal when you're in prophecy. And, and Jews, the Jews are God's special people in prophecy. There is no body of Christ in prophecy. And that's 95% of your Bible. But of course, when we bring it back to where we are in Colossians chapter 3, we read not only in Colossians, you read it in Galatians, you read it in all these other books that Paul has written to the body of Christ today, which is us. He says... Of course, talking about putting off the old man, putting on the new man, we find out there's neither Greek nor Jew today. Uh, there's neither circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. Of course, today people are in bonds, people are free, people are, you know, according to how mankind views other people, how mankind views mankind, there's, there are, you know, people who call themselves Greeks, people who call themselves Jews, people who call themselves this, people who call themselves that. And people view other people according to how they view people. But in the mind and the sight of God, you're either lost or you're saved. And that's it. And so this is how uh, God sees things. He says you're either lost or you're saved. And that's the one and only way that uh, he sees things as far as people, saved individuals or unsaved individuals. And again, that goes back to you can have an unsaved individual with a Bible in their hand up at the pulpit every day, screaming out Bible verses, saying that your salvation is found in the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when that's not true. And so you have to watch out when you go out to a place that you know refers to itself as a church and doesn't know the right gospel, doesn't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, doesn't understand uh, this Bible rightly divided. They can teach you your wrong identity, your wrong instructions, uh, what God is not doing today, and they can mix it all up. And so we're seeing this here in verse 11. Like he's saying, with, you know, in the body of Christ, there's none of these things. But And at the end, he's saying, but Christ, he's, that's where you see in verse 11, but, that's why there's the but there. But Christ is all, and in all. And so we're in Christ, Christ is in us. That's why we saw that back when we were reading this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. He says, for in him <clears throat> dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. So he's making sure that the Colossians don't focus not only on uh, philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, rudiments of the world, and the law, and so on and so forth, but they don't focus on that they're either barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free, all these, all these human mankind issues, which are, as we know, prevalent in the news, prevalent in the media, prevalent in all these things are you know, they're saying that these lives matter over these lives, and this happened, this is more important than this thing. But it's Christ that's all and in all when it comes to the believers. So we see that in verse 11. And this is what matters. This is Jesus Christ. If we look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. It says it like this to the Galatians. Because the Galatians were being tricked by people who were telling them, you need to follow the law in order to have salvation. They were being tricked, and so Paul had to write the letter, the, the epistle of the uh, Galatians to them to, to straighten them out. So we see in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, he says the same thing here. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. But ye are all one in Christ Jesus. 
And so he says, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And he says, there's neither even male nor female. And it has uh, all has to do with the fact that uh, ranks and titles and people think, well, if I'm, if I'm a male, I should have more things in Christ than a female should. Or if she's a female, she should have more things being in Jesus Christ, uh, being saved, than a male should. Uh, maybe different uh, societies would teach a different message. Uh, and thing is, none of those things matter. If you're saved, you trust the right gospel. If you're saved, you're saved. Uh, you know, preachers and pastors don't have more access to God than people who are not preachers or pastors. Everyone's on the same one. You're saved, you're saved. You're lost, you're lost. It's just that simple. It's not a matter there's different levels for different people and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a matter of this the, the different levels, quote unquote, will take place at the judgment seat of Christ. That's God's call. That's not my call. That's not anybody's call here on earth. That has nothing to do with uh, any of them. So we see that here in verse 11. But there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. He says, 12, put on, uh, Colossians 3, 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So as we see this in verse 12, he goes on to say, put on therefore, based on everything we've read in Colossians chapter 3, put on therefore as the elect of God. And we talked about this before when we were in the book of Romans, that we were talking about the elect of God, how we're in the elect one. The elect one is is uh, you always find it in the Bible as being either Israel in the book of Isaiah, uh, or you also find it as the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Isaiah. Uh, but if you look at Ephesians, I believe it's chapter 1, and we'll see in verse 4. So we'll find it here. <clears throat> it goes on the say in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me make sure I get this right. Yeah. That we are in the elect one. That's Jesus Christ. He says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, all of that sounds like it's uh, talking about the five point Calvinism doctrines that you hear normally. You hear about the election, you hear about predestination, you hear about Things being people being chosen, and the way that John Calvin taught it was that God just chooses people to be saved. He just God just picks people to be saved, and therefore people are saved because God said so. Now, of course, God can do anything He wants, but He's not going to defy His own game plan. He's not going to defy His own plan and purpose. And so we see in Ephesians chapter one verse four, He's saying, "According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, He chose." Uh, the game plan. He chose the dispensation of grace to be the plan and the operation. And then it says, having predestinated us into the adoption of children. Now, as far as the destination being pre-planned, the destination of heaven for believers was always pre-planned. But everybody here on planet Earth has a free will to be part of that plan or not. Atheists can always choose to reject God, and that's their free will. God's not going to force them. Believers can choose to accept it completely and say, yes, I absolutely believe the gospel. I need to trust the gospel. I want to learn the Bible. I want to be a part of what God's plan and purpose is. And therefore, they can join up with God's pre-planned purpose, be part of the predestinated uh, plan that God's always had. And so we see that there uh, as that kicks in. And it says, uh, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And that's uh, Ephesians 1 6. And as he goes on to talk about this, we're seeing that it's about him being accepted in the, about us being accepted in the blood. So when people say, you know, when you ask them, have you trusted the gospel? And they say, well, yeah, I've, I've accepted Jesus. That's not the gospel. It's that Christ has accepted you because you've trusted the right gospel. Christ has to accept you. You don't accept Christ. It's, there's a world of difference between the two. If you accept Christ, uh, it doesn't matter if you accept Christ or not. Christ is who Christ is, whether you accept him or whether you don't. It's that you need Christ to accept you. And the only way you do that is by trusting the gospel, that his fully sufficient payment, his death, burial, and resurrection, pays for your sins completely. 
And so that's where we go with that. But as you plug it back in to verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3, he's saying, put on therefore as the elect of God. That's where the elect comes in, that we are in the elect one as the body of Christ. Holy and beloved, owls of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. And this is where we put these things on. So we know this through uh, what we were reading in verse 10, based on putting on the new man. And the new man's not just the old you just cleaned up. That's not what the new man is. The old, the, the old man or the new man is not you getting serious about God and so on and so forth. That's not what the new man is. The new man's not some sort of self-improvement technique that you go out and do. That's you doing something on your own. That's not what it's about. But it's understanding your identity in Jesus Christ based on what he's done for us. That's what the new man is all about. When you put off the old man, you reckon things to be the, what God has done to your old man. He's killed it. And so when you reckon things to be so according to the new man, you put off the old man, you put on the new man. You're reckoning your new identity to be your true identity, which is what God says your identity is. The world all around you is going to try to tell you who you are and who you're not and, and so on and so forth. You don't reckon what the world tells you or what the media tells you or what your bosses or what your uh, friends or whatever tells you to be if it doesn't line up with God's word. We reckon what God tells us to be so. And that for that, that's that's Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8, where we read all about what God did for us and our identity based on what God did for us. Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8 tells us all about that, and that's why we went through and studied it in our verse by verse on Sundays, the book of Romans. But uh, we understand that based on trusting the gospel, that we understand that we're saved and sealed and baptized into Christ, and of course baptized, as we saw earlier, it had nothing to do with water. And so we go to Romans chapter 6, verse 6. This is where he said we were going to look into a little bit earlier. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, when we understand that the new man's not, you know, yourself just cleaned up again, or it's not you just getting serious about, uh, you know, right living, that kind of thing, for understanding this is what's happened to your old man. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, everything we've read in Romans so far, that our old man is crucified. It says our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. So the body of sin might be destroyed as we reckon it to be so. That uh, henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead died no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it goes on and explains the concept of our old man. We don't walk in it anymore. We don't even identify with it anymore because it's dead. You can't take a corpse and tell the corpse to start you know, living right and walking right and doing things right because who you used to be should be who you used to be, that, per, that persona, that old man. Should be, and that's why we reckon day by day. Uh, that's the Romans 7 struggle. That day by day, you reckon who you used to be is already a corpse, it's already dead. And the more so that it, you reckon it did, the more it tries to rise up. And that's where the struggle comes in, where you, you, uh, you reckon your identity to be so as to what Christ says it is. And this is how we find it in Colossians chapter 3. We reckon, uh, we put on, therefore, a bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. And sometimes it's not always still. Sometimes that old man tries to rise up and say, you know, I'm the one that's in charge. I'm not truly dead. I'm really, you know, I'm really the one in charge. And you have to fight back and forth day by day. And that's that's the standing versus state uh, issue that every believer has. Uh, standing versus state makes a world of difference when we understand it. So we are, we are saved. The whole time we're struggling here on planet Earth, and we're going through our daily uh, walk, looking to serve the Lord and do that which is right by him. And yet the old man tries to rise up and say, no, I'm in charge. And yet the new man is trying to rise up and say, no, I'm in charge. And that's where we put off the old man and put on the new man according to Paul's instructions. Now, if we're in the red letters and we're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
we're not even going to be in, uh, understanding the instructions we've been handed by Paul. So, and from God to Paul and Paul to us. So we see that in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. So we see that in verse 12 as it goes on through there. And as we see the series talking about this, we saw uh, what we needed to see in Ephesians. But if you look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, in verse, we'll talk about those bowels of mercies. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, in verse 1. And Paul goes on to say to them, talking about the same thing, when it comes to those bowels of mercies, he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What's the body of Christ to be united? We talked about this when we went through Philippians verse by verse. Of course, he went on to say, and we went through this last week too, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, there's that humbleness of mind we see in Colossians. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And he goes on to talk about the mind of Christ, which is a very important thing to have as a believer, to know how God sees things, to know what God's doing today, to have that mind of Christ so we can operate as he would want us to operate. So we see that in verse uh, 12. Uh, going back to Colossians 3, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering, which is a lot of the fruits of the Spirit as well from Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 22. We see that in verse 12. It goes on to there. And we see a lot about long suffering and, and so on. Verse 13 goes on to read about forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we read this as it goes on through here, it says forbearing one another. And forbearing just means to be patient or tolerant or merciful. You know, some words that are equivalent or synonymous with it. But Paul is instructing the Colossians, sort of the body of Christ in general, to forbear with one another, be, be patient with one another, be merciful to one another. Uh, you know, give each other a break. In other words, when, when someone does something wrong, when someone slips up, when someone doesn't do something exactly quite right, uh, unbelievers are quick to pounce. Others are quick to jump. Other ones are quick to be bitter and rude and arrogant, and rough, and tough and mean. Whenever somebody says just one thing out of line, people are quick to jump and hop and skip. And just anything they can do to puff themselves up. That's what they look to do. We see that in verse 13. We're the opposite. We're not looking to jump and pounce and hop and just pick out every wrong thing that's wrong with everybody. We find the opposite. We find in verse 13, we forbear one another. You know, again, meaning that we're patient with one another. We're tolerant with one another. We're merciful with one another. And it says, and forgiving one another. It says, if any man have a quarrel against any. Of course, believers can have quarrels with other believers. And if it's against another for right doctrine, it's right to have a, a doctrinal dispute. But sometimes it can even get personal. So people can uh, debate over things like what we're seeing now with the judgment seat of Christ. And right debate for right reasons is a good thing in order to settle the matter about uh, you know, having a doctrinal debate. But if I, you go out and you name call somebody or you start picking on the person's family or the person's personal issues, now you're going and you're starting a quarrel over something that's not, that's not right, that's not uh, edifying. It's not going to help the brother. It's not going to help people listening in. It's not uh, what the whole issue should be about. And so there's a quarrel starting up over something that's not why the intentional debate was there in the first place. And so we're seeing if any man have a quarrel against any. So it could be personal, it could be doctrinal, it could be a misunderstanding. Uh, it could be, you know, a private matter or a bitter matter. Whatever these issues are that come up, we're finding here in verse 13, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So the whole point of why we forgive is not going to be the Matthew 6 thing, where if you forgive someone, God will forgive you. That's not how things work today. That's not how forgiveness works today. We understand the reason why we go out and forgive other people is because we understand that we've been clearly forgiven of all of our sins in general. And that's why we go out, we do as Christ has done for us. And that Christ went out and died on the cross. He didn't have to go and die on the cross, but he did. 
And we're so glad that he did because now we have a sacrifice on our behalf. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't do enough things to get to heaven. Jesus Christ went out and did it for us. He forgave everything for us. And now likewise, we can go out and do the same for other people on purpose, even though uh, we may have some issues that come across with us. We, we need to forbear and we need to forgive. Uh, it doesn't mean we line up with wrong information. We don't do that, but we can work our, we can attempt to work our way through it. Forbearing and forgiving as much as we can. So we see that there, and the reason why is even as uh, Christ forgave us, so also do we. If we go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, we see the same thing again being said to the Ephesians. <laughs> Ephesians 4, verse 32, he tells the Ephesians, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Again, that same information. It's not Matthew 6. It's not, uh, if I forgive somebody, then I will probably, hopefully, be forgiven. That's not the issue. That's not the case. It's not Matthew 6. We're finding here that, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And that hath forgiven is a past tense verb. So things that have already happened in the past have already kicked in for you when you've trusted the gospel. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, uh, and then you trusted the gospel, uh, what happened based on what he did kicked in for you. And you understand now through reading and believing and trusting and studying God's word, 2 Timothy 2.15, understanding what God has done for us having forgiven us all trespasses, we can go ahead and do the same for others. So we see that there. And we see that also Colossians 2.13, as we come back to that. Colossians 2.13, that latter part, says that, uh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And we understand that second to last word says all trespasses. So there's not the bigger trespasses are forgiven, but the smaller ones aren't. But the smaller ones are easier to forgive, but the big ones aren't. We understand that in verse 13, Colossians 2.13, he has forgiven us all trespasses. Even the ones that we think we can't forgive ourselves of, Jesus Christ has forgiven us of. So we see that in Colossians 2.13. And when he's forgiven us all trespasses, he's forgiven us all of the sins of our past. He's forgiven us all the sins of our present, the sins we do with our mind, the sins we do with our heart, the sins that we do with our actions, and the sins we're going to be doing next, next week, next month, next year, next five years into the dying, our dying day. He's already forgiven us of all of these things. So we can operate and serve him. So we can operate and do that which is right for him, giving him glory. Uh, so we don't want to use our liberty to go off and do whatever we feel like. We want to use our liberty, that freedom we have, knowing what God's done in order to serve him better. And when we make a mistake, we just get up and keep going and keep serving, keep doing that which is right for him. So we see that in verse 12 or verse 13, going back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. And we see that uh, we don't want to let doctrinal issues become personal issues. He goes on and says in verse 14, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Now, when we were doing 1 Corinthians verse by verse, there is a, there's a, a chapter in 1 Corinthians, where it focuses on nothing but charity. And so we see here in verse 14, he says, and above all these things, above uh, everything we've been reading about so far in Colossians chapter 3, he says, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity is such an important thing. If we go back and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. What we want to look at here is, Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was teaching the Corinthians how to use their spiritual gifts. And we know it's a transitional phase because by the time you get to 2 Corinthians 12, there are, there are no spiritual gifts. But he, tell, he teaches the Corinthians because the Corinthians were of a very poor behavior. They thought since they were saved, they could do anything they felt like. And so Paul had to write to them and, and correct them and chastise them and rebuke them and say, hey, guys, get, get back in shape. Get back on the right track because you can't just be saved and do whatever you feel like. You're not serving God. You're serving yourselves. And so they would <laughs> run around with the spiritual gifts thinking they were they were kind of in a – they were thinking they were super superstars. They were thinking that they were superheroes. They were going around healing people, doing things. They thought there was a game show. And so 1 Corinthians 12 writes all about um, 
how to use the gifts properly. And then by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, there are no gifts. 1 Corinthians 13 goes on to say in verse uh, 2, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to be the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And he goes on to explain, charity suffereth long, and is kind, charity, not love. These other books, these other uh, translations say the word love. There's a huge difference between love and charity. They're two totally different things. So charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Goes on from there talking about the uh, gifts. And uh, he goes on to say in verse 13 what he's saying here in verse 14 of uh, Colossians 3. He's saying, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And of course, verse four, or chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians goes on to say, Follow after charity and the desire spiritual gifts. And he goes on from there. And uh, he'll pretty much go on to say that, uh, that uh, above all these things, that he's looking to have charity more so than spiritual gifts. He's looking to have that, and I believe it's in uh, at verse 8. He says, Charity never faileth, of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8. He says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And he goes on to explain that it's all going to fail as far as uh, the, the gifts. He knows there's going to be a time when it's all going to fade away. But he's talking about this, and uh, he explains that he would rather uh, have charity than spiritual gifts. But nonetheless, he does teach them how to use these things. And so uh, he goes on and talks about this. But uh, as he goes on and he explains this to the uh, churches, uh, he goes on to, or especially the Corinthians, uh, he goes on to explain all these things. But uh, I'll try to find the verse a little bit later exactly where he says it's verbatim. But he's going on to talk about these things, saying, follow after charity. And he talks more about charity, more so than he's talking about these, uh, about the spiritual gifts. And what he says here in, actually, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, before he gets into the charity chapter, he says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, is what he wants the Corinthians to do. He wants them to covet the right gifts so that they can operate accordingly with those gifts. And he says, and yet showing unto you a more excellent way. So I'm going to show you something even better than spiritual gifts, something more excellent than that. And then it comes into charity. So he's trying to tell the Corinthians, there's, there's, you can have all the spiritual gifts in the world, but if you're not acting right, you don't have the right behavior, uh, it's not going to benefit you anything. You can go around and heal everybody out of a hospital, but if you have the, bad, the worst attitude, you don't glorify God as you do it, uh, People of cults could go out and do that, but if they're trying to get you to, they can go out and heal you and then have you join a cult or you have a wrong mindset and you would never want to glorify Christ even after you're healed, then there's no charity involved in these things. So it's all about charity. And this is what Paul's saying to the Colossians, getting back to our point in Colossians chapter 3 in verse 14. He says, and above all these things that you read about in Colossians 3, he says, put on charity, just as he said it to the Corinthians. Now, Colossians and Corinthians had different problems going on, but the whole point is that charity is the, big, is the biggest deal going on. It's all about charity. Charity means love in action. Love, you can love sin. You can love hamburgers. You can love pizza. You can love your dog. You can love all sorts of different things. But you, when you have charity towards something, you're looking to take uh, a, a loving action towards something and do something about something in, a, in, a, in the right way. So you want to be charitable towards something, you want to do something about a certain, you want to take an action, you want to do something towards it, and you want to do a loving action towards something. But if you just love what's on TV tonight, you're not really doing anything about it. You just you, know, you just love the fact that it's there. But if you're going to be charitable towards it, 
you're going to be doing something about it. You're doing something to help them out. And that's why he says, and above all these things, put on charity, Colossians 3.14, which is the bond of perfectness. And he says that there is the bond of perfectness, meaning it's something that's going to help out. If we look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, we know it's the bond of perfectness because what it's going to do, it's going to help them love, it's going to have them um, love abound with more knowledge and judgment. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet uh, more and more within knowledge and in judgment, and in all judgment. So you see that in knowledge and in all judgment with their love abound. And so uh, knowledge and judgment are two key factors. If you want love to abound, you can do that with knowledge and judgment. So we're seeing this as two factors that kick in as he talks about this. But he's also wanting us to be in the bond of perfectness. If we look at Ephesians 4.3, as he goes through this, and Ephesians 4.3 goes on to read, there's one endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He says this for the body of Christ, wanting them to be in the unity of the spirit bond of peace, and that's what he's saying in verse 14, which is the bond of perfectness. As he goes on to uh, verse 15, and what he's going to go on to say here, as we kind of wrap up for tonight, he does in verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. So again, he's always bringing it back to the fact that the agency through which he's working with today, that God, Lord Jesus Christ, is working with today, it's not Israel, it's that one body. Uh, the new man, new creature, the church, the body of Christ. And he says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, the peace of God is something we also read about in Philippians. If we go back to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it's that peace of God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. This is where we first read about it. And the peace of God went on to say where he said, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, and there it is, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And then it went on from there. But Philippians 4, 6, and 7 talks about that peace of God. When they were to pray and uh, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's why he's going to talk about thanksgiving in uh, Colossians uh, 3.15. And what he says here is the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When they pray, we kind of studied this when we went through uh, Philippians 4. When they pray, and everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, they're going to pray, number one, with thanksgiving for uh, you know, not only the issues of the day, but in general, their, their prayer life is going to be with thanksgiving. And it says they'll pray prayers and supplication. They'll let their requests be made known unto God. And their requests are not going to be, you know, God, give me a new car. God, give me lots of money. God, give me this. God, give me that. It's going to be their requests are going to be made in accordance with understanding what God is doing today. He, Paul is understanding that the Philippians have studied and they know God's will today, God's purpose in the dispensation of grace, that the Bible is rightly divided. They're not Israel. They're not under a covenant. They're not going to get spiritual blessings. I should say material blessings, uh, because they feel like it. they know what God's doing today. They know what God's not doing today, and that according to what God is doing today, they can be thankful for what God's doing today, and therefore they can pray and according to Thanksgiving, say, Lord, thank you that uh, you're not <coughs> stoning us with stones if we so much as blaspheme uh, your name that we can put off the old man, put on the new man. You've given us a new man. You've crucified our old man. Thank you, Lord, for that. That kind of prayer life is what they would do. And that we can uh, be thankful and that we can uh, you know, pray that others would trust the gospel as we would go out and give it to them. And so uh, as they do that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, would keep their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, if we prayed for a million dollars and we didn't get it, it wouldn't keep our minds and hearts through Christ Jesus, as Philippians 4, 7 says. And we would keep saying, why didn't I get it? What did I do wrong? Why am I doing this? What am I? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you, God? What's right? Your, your hearts and minds are not kept through Christ Jesus. You're constantly questioning everything. Instead, you know what God's will is. You're lighting your prayer life up with God's will. You're lighting up your... Uh, evangelistic life with God's will. You're going out and evangelizing according to the plan and purpose of God's will, the doctrines of God, 
And so as we bring it back to Colossians 3, based on Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So as we pray, and as we serve, and as we operate, and as we study, and as we do all that we do for the Lord, we know that we will let the peace of God rule in our hearts. We can let the peace of God rule in our hearts even when we're being slammed by atheists, when we're being slammed by cult members, when we're being slammed by our own family members. We're letting the peace of God rule in our hearts, knowing that what we're doing is correct, and we're letting all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. They may mock us for it. And we can let the peace of God rule in our hearts as it passes all understanding, and we can still go out and see souls saved, 1 Timothy 2, 4. With the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 3 and 4. And we can go out and do so knowing that the peace of God passes all understanding and will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, to the which we are called in one body. And we're called by the doctrine. We're not called because God picked him, but not him. That's, that's again, John Calvin's wrong information. It's, we're called when we heard the doctrine. Again, that's Ephesians 1.13. We'll read that real quick. When we're called, we're called because we heard something and we believe what we heard. Whether it was through social media, whether it was through a friend that gave us the gospel, whether it was through reading the book and we understood what the Bible told us. Ephesians 1.13 says, And whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which, when you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, that goes back to the faith and the operation of God, Colossians chapter 2. We didn't see it. We didn't feel it. But the word here says that it happened. So we believe what the word tells us, and the word works effectually in us, so we have that confidence of knowing what the faith of the operation of God does. And as we know this to be so, we know this to be true, we believe God over our own feelings, over the, the world around us, over everything that's going on in social media or news as we know it to be so. And we take this to be true over anything else, and we operate accordingly, knowing that the peace of God rules in our hearts, uh, to the which also we're called in one body, and we're thankful accordingly. So we know this, that's the will of God itself, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. So we're strong in the grace of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. So with that, we'll wrap up a little bit early tonight. And uh, we'll open for any kind of thoughts or questions based on what we've gone through in Colossians chapter 3. We're seeing it's a strong chapter, which uh, deals with our understanding of putting off the old man, putting on the new man. Again, we know that by... Putting off the old man, we understand that who we used to be is crucified. We just have to reckon that to be so, according to the words on the page. And the new man, we understand it's not uh, ourselves just cleaned up. And we understand it's not ourselves just getting serious about uh, you know right living. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with you know self improvement. It has nothing to do with that. But it has to do with understanding our identity and what Christ did for us. Our, our Understanding our identity in Christ Jesus. So, myself is one thing, but myself in the position of Christ, who I am in Christ Jesus, is something totally different. My life is now hidden in Christ, as Colossians tells me that. So, so with that, we'll stop there, and we'll open up for any kind of thoughts or questions based on Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. Yeah. 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 Put off the old man, putting on the new man. Yeah. I'm a preacher. That's what that is. Charity is better than love. Yeah. Yeah. Charity is love and action and love. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. Got that. So different. Because yeah. I can see charity. Ah, oh, look at this. Cancer. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, 
Yeah. I don't know if there's any other thoughts or questions or anything, but we could wrap up a little early or. All right, let me see what time it's uh oh it's about 8.05. Well, we could uh let's call it early for tonight and we'll be back here Sunday and uh, have the room open all the time. So yeah. So I mean yeah, you know. So all right. Well we'll see everyone on uh, Sunday. We'll be back here Sunday and we'll have the chat room open all the time. So all right. Have a great night. Grace and peace. Yeah, we'll see everyone later.